I'd like to take you guys on a journey with me. Uh, one that looks at how one of the most prosperous nations in Latin America took a turn for the worst, how their citizens ended up uh, without uh, imports of medicine or food, and, and what they're doing in order to keep themselves alive today. Venezuela has a hyperinflation problem. Their currency is severely undervalued. Uh, it, it's gotten this way because back in the uh, late 90s, Venezuela figured out that they are sitting on one of the world's biggest reserves of natural oil. Bigger than Saudi Arabia, it was projected that Venezuela has, was sitting on top of 300 billion barrels of oil. Uh, what their government decided to do was to nationalize the oil production industry instead of having it owned uh, by private businesses and managing it. The government was going to extract the oil from the ground and any revenue that was made by those oil productions would go back into the government. There was a lot of uh, uh, poorly managed funds in those government businesses. And that's where this man, Hugo Chavez, uh, came about. He ran his presidential campaign in Venezuela on a platform that said that he would eliminate all of the corruption in the big oil business in Venezuela. And instead of having the revenue from the oil business go back into the Venezuelan government uh, for them to use, he would instead use that revenue for social welfare programs for the poor and disenfranchised in Venezuela. Things like health care and food, etc. Unfortunately for Venezuela, this led them to something known as the Dutch disease. This happens to a lot of different countries who are uh, suddenly find this natural uh, resource of an abundance of it and decide to export it uh, right. they, they take a whole bunch of this oil and it's their main export. They just send it out. And during the early 2000s, the price per barrel of oil was so high that they were actually able to do this um, and still be able to afford a lot of their social uh, welfare programs. But they didn't diversify their economy and they did not have a lot of other exports for things like agriculture uh, or, or uh, different finished goods. Uh, so eventually when the price per barrel of oil fell, so did the value of their dollar, which is why we see that the price for toilet paper in Venezuela is, is a giant stack that's even larger than the toilet paper itself in uh, Venezuelan boulevards. I'd like you guys to imagine just off the coast of Venezuela, an island. Um, we're not talking about Cuba or anything, but an island that's full of a whole bunch of natural resources, stuff that generate infinitely. Uh, it's filled with gold, it's filled with wood, it doesn't have as much oil, but it has a vast community and a marketplace that's already growing and is willing to sell any kind of good. And I'd like you guys to imagine that it actually is there. You may not see this on a map, uh, but this is a place called Gillenwald. It is a make-believe world where people can join online in a video game and play uh, with a whole bunch of other people, collect resources, kill monsters, and make money for themselves. A surprising thing uh, that I found out uh, was that the search terms for, for RuneScape over the past five years are predominantly in Venezuela. Uh, and this is because Venezuelans are trying to search for anything that would make them more money than uh, working at a typical job in Venezuela today. Uh, Venezuelans are using old hardware that they have available to them to run this early 2000s video game in order to make currency and sell that for US dollars, for pounds, or for, for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, because it's a lot easier for them to make transactions with that type, type of currency. 
This is even a picture of a grandma who was tasked to kill a really cool boss in RuneScape in order to help make money for their family. This is the average uh, salary for a Venezuelan. And for anybody that notices uh, per month, that is not a typo. It is $4.50 per month is the average salary for a Venezuelan uh, in, in Bolivares. But while playing RuneScape, they figured out they could make upwards of $40 to $60 a month. This is 10 times what they would typically be making at any other typical job in Venezuela. So it's undeniable to understand why they would do something like this. The liquidity of, of this digital currency in order to be translated to um, cryptocurrencies or, or uh, PayPal uh, receive, receive PayPal amounts of US dollars, this is why they decided to move to this line of business. Of course, they were working in a video game for digital currency, for items that don't exist, that appear out of nowhere, in a world where resources aren't limited, in a world where things grow back and, and dying isn't real. There's still value in this type of currency. One of the major things that Venezuelans decided to do was hunt dragons because they really wanted to collect their bones. It was a very popular item to sell on the marketplace for, uh, for this game. And uh, it was very easy for anybody to quickly launch the game to immediately start doing something like this. Uh, this was pretty much the easiest way for Venezuelans to farm currency uh, while starting new accounts. And when we look at, um, at graphs that show the quantity of some of these items traded over time. Uh, I'd like to advise you guys about uh, this history in Venezuela in which a global power outage happened, a, a countrywide power outage. Um, Venezuela, 70% of Venezuela was left out of power for four to five days. And during this time, the, the quantity of these items traded plummeted. Venezuelans moved on to hunting different types of dragons, and this is uh, one of my favorite, uh, favorite kinds to hunt. Um, these dragons Venezuelans found very profitable. Uh, it, it did not take that long to um, enter in the game to hunt down these kinds of things, and when they killed it, they could expect really high rates of return. Um, without putting a lot of time or commitment into their accounts or their characters. So this is why they found them very profitable. Ultimately, it led them to, uh, to try and kill these creatures in, in mass droves in big communities. Venezuelans would group up and hunt down these things together. And the community in the game noticed that. Uh, they did not want the items that these creatures dropped to start coming and flooding into the marketplace because it would devalue anybody that did own these items. So big groups and clans decided to gather together and hunt down Venezuelans and target them specifically in a virtual world. And while killing somebody online in a video game doesn't hurt them physically, for these Venezuelans, this could be their livelihood. Uh, these, these creatures that they're killing, they're doing it to make money for themselves, to sell that in-game currency for real-world money, to put food and, and medicine in their, in their pockets. So, although I, I didn't um, talk a lot about uh, the history of Venezuela and why it got there, I'd like to bring it a little bit back towards uh, Hugo Chavez. The, the social welfare programs that he brought in in Venezuela in the early 2000s were very good for the nation. And a lot of the Venezuelans who uh, were alive uh, or were living in Venezuela at the time uh, 
really enjoyed Hugo Chavez and his social programs. But again, when the price of oil dropped uh, in the later two, 2010s, um, so did the value of their currency. And Venezuelans are searching for any other alternative. And I'd like to bring uh, a light to uh, certain organizations where you guys could help to donate towards Venezuelans, such as uh, World Vision and AmeriCares. Uh, these are the two different organizations that, um, that you guys might be willing to look towards uh, in order to donate to help uh, these Venezuelans uh, not have to be forced to um, farm in-game currency to, in order to put food on their table. Thank you.